<laughs> All right. No, we just post berserk memes on A. Yeah. You guys ever go to those panels of just meme panels? <laughs> I've been to some of those. I've been to. If you post that one with Griffith and Garfield, I will die. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, uh, come on, buddy. What are you doing here? All right, we're back, we're back. Very finicky system today, all right. So, all right, we kind of mentioned the beginning here. I am not up to date. A few of you are not up to date as well. This panel will contain spoilers, but I don't know what we're gonna spoil today, ladies and gentlemen, because I am only the facilitator. We will discuss any and all aspects of Berserk that you are interested in discussing today. All right, this is a moderated discussion panel. And we can go any number of routes that we would like to go today, all right? So, who here has read the manga? Any of the manga? Any of the manga? Not yet. About half, about half. <laughs> who has seen the original 97 animation? Most of us, all right? 16 and 17, the sequels. A much smaller percentage. All right, and who's seen the uh, the Golden Age uh, movies? Yes. All right, all right, very good, very good. So we're gonna cover the gamut. Anybody watch the uh, the new series on uh, Crunchyroll? Fuck uh, no. What's what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> Shit's ass. All right. <laughs> so uh, we had a discussion here before the panel started. I actually haven't watched it yet. Um, you're not feeling that, huh? You're not feeling that one. That's ugly as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't all know what right. to say. <laughs> Is anybody not familiar with Berserk at all and just going to this panel on whims? This guy. This guy. All right, all right. What do you know about Berserk, my friend? Literally nothing. <laughs> you know something. Your, your, your friends here have told you, you, you you've learned something through osmosis. What oh, do you know? Yeah, okay, yeah, totally. It's Angry Guy with a Sword. <laughs> I, I, I Griffith did nothing wrong. Angry Guy with a Sword right? person. You learned that too, right? All right. <laughs> so, we're going to talk Angry Guy with a Sword later. All right. So for those that aren't familiar with the background here, this manga has been running for over 30 years, all right? Now, of course, uh, uh, Muria passed away uh, very, very tragically here in the last couple of years. And so there was some discussion about would we ever see the end of Berserk, okay? And this is a thought exercise for everybody here, all right? I'm gonna give you two options, gang. Would you rather have new Berserk every year for the rest of the year of your life and get to enjoy that story for the rest of your life? Or do you want to know how it ends? All right? First option, Berserk for the rest of your life. Who's in? All right, who wants to know how this sucker ends? <laughs> yeah. What if I told you it's going to be as disappointing as the Game of Thrones ending? <laughs> Are you still in for it? I never watched Game of Thrones, all so right. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I guess what I mean. <laughs> all right, all right. So, the manga, you know, Muria has had a lot, he had a lot of downtime, he had a lot of, uh, a lot of breaks, a lot of sabbaticals, all right? But the art, the art is something that just, you know, this is like the gold standard of, of fantasy uh, of manga here. Uh, for those that have been following the manga for, for years, do you guys feel that the art got better or it got worse over the years? Better. Better? You felt it was noticeably improving? All right? Yeah. Uh, Muria has some awesome, awesome splash pages. It was brought up earlier about the fact that, uh, you know, reading the e-books is not the same, right? When you, when you have that hard copy, that physical copy, and you turn that page, and it's a big-ass splash page, and it's just, boom, it hits you, right? right? There's also the, the textile, the, 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 the texture, the feel of the book, right? But there's nothing quite like that splash page, okay? So Muria, incredibly detailed here. Uh, here's some of those splash pages we talked about, right? When you just turn that page and it, it just jumps out at the, uh, from the book at you, okay? So we've got over 30 years of manga. We've got the 97 series, all right? Uh, the 97 series here, this is a, uh, a show that was put together by Oriel for Light and Magic, all right? Does anybody own this on DVD? I win. No? No? Anybody? All right. You? Um, yeah. I have it. It says season one, but season two never came out. Mm. I 
I'd like to see the, the copy there. I'm wondering if that's, if that's a, uh, uh, an Anime Works release there. But uh, for those that, that might have a physical copy of this, uh, have you seen the extras? They've got extras on the physical copies, the DVDs. And they talk about, with the creators of the animation, they talk about the thought process that went behind putting this show together and putting it on television, all right? You've watched it, gang. There's blood, right? There's a lot of adult content and themes, right? Okay? So, in the U.S., that probably wouldn't have happened. It probably would have been, spent, would have been censored, okay? But in the extras on the DVDs, if you ever acquire a physical copy of these, they actually talk about the fact that they respect the audience. They believe the audience can consume this information, that they can absorb it, that they can make a differentiation in their heads between uh, what is you know, animated violence and what is real violence is not going to cause people to go out and commit crimes and, and, and do damage, right? And I think us as fans of this property, this is a very, very heavy property. I could easily make this an 18 plus panel. It's not an 18 plus panel, so some of the scenes that maybe you're familiar with aren't going to be shown. Uh, but those scenes were shown on Japanese prime time, right? They were part of the, uh, the original presentation, okay? Film adaptations, if you guys don't have the, uh, the time, the bandwidth for full 26 episodes, the film adaptations uh, collect the Golden Age arc into three, uh, three, three movies. Uh, very, very well done. The animation style is quite different. Okay. Uh, Studio 4C, if you're familiar with 4C, they are the creators uh, of the, uh, the films. Okay. And it does tell that Golden Age arc over again. The, uh, the battle uh, of, with Guts versus the 100 Men, anybody remember that one from the, uh, the films? Right. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. We have the 16 and 17 sequels. All right. We'll say no more. We'll say more later. Right. <laughs> so, if my if my mother were here, she'd say they sucked. Never uh, watched them. Mom was not a fan. Oh no, she loves Berserk, but yeah, oh, like no, no. she 16, just. 17. Yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. not a fan. She's like watch yeah. anything but those. So you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Item uh, 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 evidence article number one. Right, uh, 2016, 2017, okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's my right? uh, Oh my gosh. Right. Wow. Uh, the animation. <laughs> I, I promised you animation, and we're gonna sit here and watch this for 30 seconds straight. Oh my. We are gonna loop this, all right? Oh my god. <laughs> What's wrong with his mouth? <laughs> <laughs> now, now for, for, for the folks in the audience, did anybody take anything, any type of enjoyment from 16 to 17? The music. The music? The music is solid. No. Right? Like, we'll talk about the music later. The, like, plot. How are you raising your hand, man? You haven't seen any of this. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, over on this side, what did you guys take from, from 16 to 17? Uh, I mean, I definitely liked, liked a lot of the characters and stuff. The animation was like iffy, but... I could gravitate enough towards them and their like motivation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Brand, brand brand new characters and that yeah. What yeah. Character? Well, I can't, I can't remember names. But uh -huh. like, there was that fencing guy, or whatever that kept the ah like, Serpio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fan fan there. All right, yeah. We're gonna definitely talk about any of the characters you guys want to talk about that we have time for. Uh, but we got that. Yes. Uh, I talked to the voice actor of uh, Guts in Berserk 2016, and I asked him uh, what his thoughts on it. <laughs> well, the, the individuals that directed it, the individuals that directed 2016 and 17, this was their first time working in this type of field uh, with respect to the CGI. Uh, if you go back and you watch the original promos for, 50, uh, for, for the 16 series, uh, there is a distinct difference there in the looks, okay? Um, the, uh, the promo here, let me see if I have the promo available. It, uh, I got the promo somewhere, but we'll come back to it. Uh, they did go back and redo this and brush it up for the Blu-ray, okay? Uh, if you watch the, uh, the uh, series as it showed, much more of that potato type of look, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they did clean it up, they did sharpen it up for the Blu-ray release. Okay. That's okay. Uh, but the characters there, that is one of the reasons why I would love to do a second Panel where we just talk about everything after the Golden Age because those are very different characters, all right? <laughs> yeah. And 16 and 
17, there's, there's clips, there's slivers of things that make you appreciate it. But then you have this. <laughs> this is literally the same sequence. Right. <laughs> Bruh. And uh, possibly my favorite <laughs> gift that I've seen from this series. Right? <laughs> and just loop this guy, all right? Oh my god. So, the story though, the story gang. I was able to get past the animation, and I'm going to talk over this animation here for the next 60 seconds. I was able to get past the animation because the story is so strong. And, and as you said, the characters, their motivations, their, their, you know, what makes them human, that is something that, that keeps, you, uh, keeps you going there. So, now, uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump back. We've kind of set the stage now, all right? We set the stage, and I want to make sure that we get to talk about and have a conversation, a facilitated conversation about the things you guys want to talk about. We talked about the music a little bit. We didn't talk about it. We mentioned the music, all right? We brought up some of the different characters. Uh, we've discussed some of the uh, different mediums. All right. I am prepared to talk any part of this that you'd like. The characters, the themes, the music, uh, key milestones, key points here. What would you guys like to start with? This, is, this panel is for you. In the back, yes, on the aisle. Um, I was going to say characters. When you watch animation, when you watch anime, are you driven by the story? Are you driven by the, the character development? Or are you driven by the thematic elements? All right, somebody else. You can pick one, my friend, pick one. I don't really have a stake other than I don't think Griffith did anything wrong. <laughs> all, right. all right, all right, shall we start there? Shall we start there? Right. Spicy take. He, he definitely expressed how he felt towards Graham and the Hawk. And everyone should have taken the hint. But they didn't, and they were fucking stupid and ignorant. And look where they got them. Alright, alright. We're gonna dive right into it. Griffith did nothing wrong, right? Hey. <laughs> okay. Who's familiar? Who's familiar with the the key betrayal that Griffith enacted? Not me. All right, all right, because you don't want to use the word betrayal, right? <laughs> because he was, everybody should have seen what he was. Everyone what he should have developed. seen it coming. Come all on, right. y'all done. Anybody agree with that? Anybody agree that they should have seen that coming? That he, he, he wanted to leave? All right, all right, we, we, got, we got half of a hand here. All right, what's, what's your rationale for believing they should have seen it coming? Well, it's not like everyone has a complaint. It's not like everyone talks to him and understands the second. It's like he had expressed multiple times that he was willing to do anything to yeah. achieve his goal. One second. And so, at least for them, they never expected that they would become an obstacle in him achieving his goal. Thank that you. That was the only assumption that yeah. they made. Yeah, though, though, to be fair, like when they, usually when you hear someone like, oh, I want to do everything it takes to like, achieve my goal, you usually don't expect, oh, I'm going to throw you under the bus too, because at that point, why would you even be there, you know? Now, now, you say throw them under the bus. Uh, is the eclipse throwing them under the bus, or is the eclipse <laughs> is an order of magnitude higher? A little bit. I think it's less of a bus, and more like a steamroller. Yeah. All right, so my, my friend went there with the glasses. What you got for us? Yeah. Honestly, because I watched the Casca recruitment clip recently and all, he doesn't really invite anybody to over, hey, whoever the heck you want. Like, hey, are you going to fight for me? Are you going to do my goals and all that stuff? And just like when he told Grant to the princess for him to say it, So everybody in this room here, you guys all have something that motivates you in your daily lives. Maybe you have jobs that motivate you. Maybe you have personal pursuits that motivate you, right? Would you say you're motivated by your own personal dream or goal right now? Or would you say that that's ambiguous and perhaps you are similar to the band of the hawk and perhaps you are being pulled along by somebody else's dream? Well, I don't give two shits about anyone's dream. 
Do you feel do you feel like you are personally motivated for do you do you see what your dream is? Do you are you like Griffin? No. No? I yeah, like you, him, but you, you haven't, like it, him it hasn't come into focus yet? <laughs> huh? It hasn't come into focus yet? No. Let's take a look here. I got a little clip of Griffith here. For those that aren't familiar with Griffith, we can see uh, we can see a bit of his uh, his psyche in this clip. All right, the will, the motivation, the drive of Griffith. Might not be familiar. This is towards the end of the uh, the series in the Golden Age here, where he's been tortured. He's had his cut, his tongue cut out. He's had all of his tendons cut. All right, but he's still found the ability within himself to push forward and drive towards his goal. Right, even though he's basically been completely kneecapped. All right, so you know, I don't know that I would have that drive because I don't to know be that fair, I. Be fair, we don't live in the Middle Ages. No, no, we don't. So. We don't. It's tough to make that corollary. All right. So, the band of the hawk, as it pertains to Griffith, we said you don't expect to get thrown under that bus, right? But the band of the hawk, they have their own motivations. They have their own things that drive them. Okay. And as part of that, you know, they look to Griffith as some type of leader, parental figure, brother, whatever it might be, okay? So, uh, is there a particular character in the Band of the Hawk that you guys identified with? Anybody you particularly were drawn to? Definitely Casca. Casca? Oh, yeah. yeah. Anybody else feel like they identified with Casca and, and her personality or flight? Okay. What about Casca did you identify with or that you were drawn to? I mean, the fact that she did, you know, like, push forward, she, uh, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm trying to put it into words, <laughs> it's hard, she, she had, had, she got the chance to join him when, when she was at a hard time in her life, she changed it around, and she's, she becomes a, a very strong woman, she's able to fight for herself, and she chooses to fight under Griffith, mm -hmm. and I mean, like, she, she kind of hopes that, that he sees her as, like, a love interest. That doesn't happen, but, you know, she, had to, she still doesn't change all that much. Her nature is not, is not necessarily changed, and I find that that is wonderful. That's a wonderful uh, thing to have. You think she was true to herself through the entire story arc? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to drop something on you guys. I'm not saying I agree with this, but this is something that somebody voiced in another version of this panel I did. They felt that Casca was a very one-dimensional character. Hmm. No depth. Anybody agree with that? No. No? No? All right. Now, I'm not saying you agree with... You got your hand raised there, my friend. What's up? Oh, I was just kind of... Oh, no, no, no. No, I'm sorry. The, the gentleman behind you. I would say so because the baseline of her personality is like, I am the story and I'm fighting I guess I can see it as in like I am woman, I am woman in you know, like, shown in anime kind of thing. Yeah, any kind of like oh um, after this war is over, I'm going to uh, start a family and go open up a shop. Like there was a scene where after the slave hundred men, people were he was talking about every person's dream, but there was, wasn't really anything. It's like oh I am an instrumental disguise. Right, and 
at that time, her dream was, Gri was Griffith's dream, right? Yeah. Right. But would you agree that she evolved as a character and she realized there was something beyond that? Or do you disagree with that? Well, she let the bandit off just so until Griffith came back. So it's not like, hey, um, I'm on standby because I'm waiting for the real guy to the rain. It's not supposed to make you just your own. Do you feel she had any type of internal confliction? Or do you think that it was never even a question for her? See, towards the end, like when she started calling for uh, Gus, I would see it. But like up until that point prior to Gus leaving, no. Yeah, and I would argue that the fact that Guts caused her to have this change, I think that builds her beyond that one-dimensional character. Absolutely. I don't think she was ever a one-dimensional character, but that's just my opinion. Um, but the fact that we see her growth, that we see her evolution, that we see her, her thinking when she starts to have these interactions and these feelings for Guts uh, in, a, in addition to Griffith, that confliction is probably something that a lot of us have felt, whether it be with relationships or whether it be with... Uh, 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 personal goals or, or, or different aspects of our lives. Uh, let me see here, I got a clip, uh, for those that aren't familiar, I got a clip uh, with Casca as well. Uh, Casca is a very, very interesting character in my opinion. So this is Casca during the eclipse, and here we see how strong she is, how much of a leader she is. And I would, uh, I would argue that this actually invalidates a lot of the uh, perception of the typical shonen tropes for a female character in anime. around her but she's taking charge and uh, there's other battles throughout the series where uh, it's her against the big bad uh, she has to basically hold her own and defeat them so you know uh, anybody else have any thoughts on Casca or, or things they'd like to explore with this character uh, on the aisle please um, I think the one reason why people and nice and loud for the whole room I think one big reason why people in general think that she might be one dimensional is that for a long period of the Golden Age arc, she doesn't have a lot of momentum, like for Griffith or for uh, Guts. For them, they are able to establish or develop a personal goal that they'll be able to work towards. With her, she kind of represents certain ideas within the, the, the band of the Hawk where they are kind of aimless and like she did wait for, for Griffith uh, to assume command. But I, I, I also agree with you that I don't think it invalidates the fact that she was in a leadership position and grew more into that role and showed her effort towards like different goals, even if it wasn't a personal like dream. And then uh, uh, two seats over there. You have something, then we'll go to the back row there. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say that I think um, in the case of Asuka, I think for me, Asuka was very interesting because is an example of, I believe in the case of an example of people conflating area characters that are symbols boiled down with one dimensional characters. Like, it's also the same thing with Gus, where he boiled down as this is angry dude who, who just likes killing. Uh -huh. And you're just kind of ignoring all the different development and the philosophy themes and forming throughout the series and all of that. Yeah, did you catch that, man? Development and philosophy. Not just a big angry guy with a sword. All right, <laughs> <laughs> All right. back row there, back row, my friend. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, reinforce the idea that I don't think her lacking any personal goals for herself really makes her one dimensional. And as you all just said, that she later on has a conflict between siding with uh, Guts a little bit. That just adds to her depth as a character. It shows that she has an internal conflict. How many of us get to be in our 20s and our 30s and even older, and we don't necessarily have our personal goals yet? Some of us are still aimless, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, talked a little bit about Griffith, talked a little bit about Casca. I would like to explore, I would like to explore uh, Serpico. Oh, and he's bailing right now as I bring no, this guy. That's, that's, all right, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right. Really good path. 
No worries, brother, no worries. All right. Do you guys want to talk about any other characters, or do you want to change gears here and talk themes or music or something? All right, go for it, man. Uh, the God Hand. The God Hand? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the God Hand. We got us the God Hand. All right. Let's start off with a little clip here. Who wants to uh, uh, work for me here? All right. Very, very early in the uh, season one here, the original 97 anime, there's some time jumps here, but uh, this is Guts uh, basically being uh, you know, mentally pursued, haunted, if you will, by uh, by, uh, by Femto slash Griffith and the, uh, the God Hand. All right. So what would you like to discuss about the God Hand tonight? Um, I guess to get the conversation started, I'll just ask a simple question for anyone that's got up to that point in the story, what they think the God Hand represents and why that's important to the story. Ah, uh, yes, I like that. Who's got a thought? What does the God Hand represent to you? And then what was the other part? Like how, why, why they think they're important to the yeah. story. What, where is their weight in the story? All right, up front, up front, yes. All right. Um. I guess well, like it, it all starts because Griffith has the, oh gosh, I I I I, I forget what it's called yeah. the the, the, the egg, yeah. you know, and like it, it, it was given to him or sold to him. He he doesn't necessarily know what it was except that it'll give him power eventually, and and everything that that happens in the series eventually tumbles, you know, like to him eventually like you know cutting himself and his blood being poured onto the egg and summoning those things and all of these thoughts of just wanting power. He wants his, his power. And so I guess maybe in simple terms, it's just they're manifestations of temptation. I mean, like, the, the, they say that they're, like, they're, they say they're, like, dark angels or something of that sort. So, like, demons, you know, dark angels... Fallen angels, any, anything of, of that sort. Okay. But I guess in simple terms, temptation. So we got, uh, up, up front here, we got the idea that perhaps the God Hand is, you know, dark angels, temptation, demons, okay? Anybody else perceive the God Hand as something similar or different? Uh, with the uh, glasses, I should both have glasses now that I see it. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> the hoodie first and then, uh, and then stocking cap. All right. Honestly, I would just say just like agreeing. Um, they're just like tempters and all that stuff, but they're not. Okay, they're inherently evil because they're supposed to be representations of like demons and all that stuff, but they're just like enabling it. It's just like if I sell you a gun and you use the gun, cool. Like I'll give you what you need, but are you uh, brave enough to suffer the consequences? Because they already know what the end result is. Because their goal is to allow humanity to do whatever they Would you agree that that does not definitively make them evil? They could be neutral, they could be good. Yeah, because it depends on who's using it. If the person who's actually uh, committing the crime that's evil, you're just enabling or just being a provider to be true and neutral in that sense. Well, what do you think there, Mike? Well, I, I definitely agree. I think I definitely agree with that statement in that, like, they, well, they're definitely. They definitely have will over their own stuff and like intentions with whoever they are. Like they aren't the ones that like, push the bill over ones that get the uh, bailiff and then make the deal with them. They're the ones that are actively pursuing these desires. And I'd also further argue that they're essentially Bruce's world's version of justice. 
the version of justice. Yeah, like mm. the world, like this set is version of justice, and that is by virtue of Griffith's character throughout the story. Like, because of the fact that uh, the sword doesn't inherently, despite the fact that Griffith does this terrible thing, it doesn't inherently mark him as evil, and in terms of objective progress, he actually does more for humanity overall, like past like the Golden Age stuff, mm -hmm. than like Gus does. So you can argue that the fact that he's being like, he's the hero in the narrative, so by proxy, they are the ones helping him enact that justice. Does the God Hand in that scenario have to have a counterpart? You know, it, are they, if they're the ones pushing things forward, that takes them beyond neutral, right? They have to have some type of, uh, they have to have some type of uh, barometer, positive or negative, beyond neutral if they're, if they're pushing things forward, right? I mean, like, in that, so, like, I would argue that in that situation, like, technically speaking, like, Griffith would be that, but they definitely are the ones that put to provide that tool, that tool for it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Not a cool thought. I don't know if you want to go. Um, I like the way you said that. Um, if anything, I wouldn't. I can't really say whether or not they're they're positive or negative or neutral, but they definitely, even though they don't take any actions the same way that Griffith does or Femto, uh, they are very big on like facilitating those actions, even though in the long run, Femto's actions does benefit humanity. Uh, there is something to question about what happens in order for that to, to happen, like with the eclipse, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like for that to be origin, how does that uh, contextualize everything that happens afterward? Like, does there always need to be a sacrifice for something? Is this the, the end justify the means question? Yes, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the God hand, whether they're good, bad, or neutral, whether they're pushing things forward or just presenting the tool and letting humanity decide, all right, that plays into one of the uh, the main themes of Berserk, right, and that is the uh, the idea of fate or self determination, right. Go ahead, and put in this clip. In this world, is the destiny of mankind controlled by some transcendental entity or law? Is it like the hand of God hovering above? At least it is true that man has no control, even over his own will. Yeah, so that is one of the governing questions within Berserk, right? And for the audience members here, all right, this question, the answer, can be rooted in your philosophical beliefs, it can be rooted in your religious beliefs. Uh, do you guys believe that things are already predetermined, that there is the concept of fate. Who thinks that things are predetermined? Who's willing to say that? One person, all right. Does everybody else think that we have the ability to change our, uh, our, our future? We have self-determination? The question is how you change and what you change. Okay, can you elaborate there? Well, let's say, with a certain person, they're hard-headed and stubborn. If they refuse to change, their future is already set because they refuse to change. But for their change, how they behave, even if it's slightly, if they want to start to go with the flow or to listen to others, they have other consequences and outcomes and effectively change their quote-unquote fate. Okay, so... But it's got to be like very fine-tuned. It's a lot of small things that are very important. Uh-huh, okay, okay. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, on the uh, on the back row there. Yeah, I, I I don't feel like I have much to say in these conversations because I don't uh, because like I said I don't watch the anime or manga, but there was this one I guess you could call it anime uh, that I watched where they discussed fate and one solution against it if you could call it that is uh, that you can't change the end result of fate, but the journey to get to that fate uh, 
See, that's actually where I thought the first gentleman was going there, but that's not where you were going, right, man? You were actually you were actually taking a different uh, a different uh, attack there. Like, you were you were. Of change about that. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I'll frame it ahead. I was kind of thinking something similar where, like, 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 fate itself, like, there is fate, but how we get to fate can be, like, very different, but, like, fate somehow changes, like, the order of how it happens. Like, it's chaotic, but the fate will be the same in the end. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can, I can, I can parse what you're saying. And this is actually a very similar um, percentage breakdown compared to the other times that I've talked about this in other versions of the panel. Um, uh, there's nothing wrong with being on either side of this, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, question, but I have generally found that it's a much smaller percentage of the audience that feels things are predetermined uh, versus those that feel that things can be changed, right? Now, uh, in terms of uh, what the uh, what our friend in the back row said with, with regards to changing the journey, do you guys feel that's sufficient, or do you think that's actually not not what you're looking for in terms of that fulfillment, or do you even need that fulfillment? Yes, with the uh, with the hoodie. Um, I'll say so because like, what is fate to be human eyes? Okay, let's say if um, I go to the future ten years from now, and then I saw my history or everybody else. Bring it back to the God hand. Does the God hand care about the journey, or does the God hand care about the end game, or do they not care at all? I say they mm -hmm. care. I say they care because the idea of God hand is to kind of like um, fulfill like people's dream or people ideal, something like that. So it can feel the complete collectiveness of humanity. All right. So you you keyed in on the word evil there, right? Yeah. Does anybody else feel that the God hand is not inherently evil? I would say more selfish. Yeah. Mm. Selfish. It's like the one game saying, you know, that's like, hey, do whatever you need to do, I'll provide it. Because you kind of So, so if you perceive the guy hand as selfish, that means they're not necessarily an agent of some some governing rule of the universe, right? They have autonomy. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Right. Interesting. Did you have something you wanted to add there, Mitch? Um. Yeah, I was just going like. You know, for the moment, like the whole thing is like very selfish. Um, they're not necessarily honored with that, and that's gets shown off, especially with one of the god hands, like later on after the whole uh, eclipse. Mm -hmm. um, and so it influences that idea. It's like they are much more the, a fan of like the end point, like they want Rickard to fulfill his destiny and stuff, because they find it fun to see that destiny mm -hmm. play out. And no matter what how it ends up going, they are in the way. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. You guys want to hit another theme? You want to hit another character? You want to take a look at the music? Where would you like to go? <laughs> the music? All right, let's jump back here. And let's talk about the music. All right. So, 97. Suzumu Hirasawa. Anybody familiar with this gentleman? What do you guys know about? Any 
Anything? Sorry? Um, did he sing a song for Millennium Actress? He did the music for Millennium Actress. That's true. That's true. He's a composer. Right. And he does, he, he's done a lot of uh, uh, film scores. Yeah. Animation is not necessarily what he gravitates to. But Satoshi Kone is a big fan, or was a big fan, because Kone's passed away. Satoshi Kone was a big fan of, uh, of, of Hirasawa's. Got him to do Millennium Actress. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the creative staff of Berserk, also a huge fan. All right? So Hirasawa, he's not an anime guy, but he's done some fantastic soundtracks to animation because he has that classical music background. Okay? So... Now, Hirasawa didn't have anything to do with the, uh, the opening or the ending, uh, but he had a lot of the key, uh, the key songs within here, okay? So, uh, with regards to the music, all right, anybody remember this particular page here uh, from the manga? Anybody remember this scene? Can anybody tell where this is? Where, where are we in the story there, my friend? Um, I don't actually remember the name of the, the, the actual like, castle. Like, uh -huh. Right, right. But, but sure. what happened in the story at this juncture? Um, it was. I remember them having a scene they were talking, and Griffith had um, shown him the. The, the, the helmet. And right after that was when the actual, like the, the royal family came and had a discussion. Right. About the before the ballroom scenes. Yep, yep. And this was right after they had recoup recuperated from fighting Zod, right? Yes, yes. Right? All right, so this is a powerful scene in the manga. Anybody else remember this scene from the manga? A couple of us, all right? You know, when you put music to it though, which hopefully we'll be able to hear over the, uh, the next room here since I don't have it going through the speakers, when you put Hirasawa's soundtrack to it though, uh, it, adds a it adds even more heft, even more power. Tell me, three years ago, you said that you didn't want to lose an outstanding soldier. I am just a soldier serving you, but you are about to lose your life for me. A soldier, one of hundreds. It's not the kind of thing that happens to a level-headed man like you. So why? Oh, that. I thought we'd ended this discussion. And three years ago at that, no reason in particular. Do you really need one? Will you always be left doubting me when I lay down my life for you? All right. So, anybody recognize that or remember that from the, the series? Did the, did the music strike you when you watched it or was the music an afterthought? Afterthought for you? Anybody else get drawn in by the music, though? It blended in, so... Well, you felt it was more of a background kind of a vibe? Yeah, it was, like, very, like, lulling in a, in a way. It does build, but I can see it, it kind of has that same cadence all the way through. Mm -hmm. All right? This scene here is another one. A very different type of uh, song that Hirosawa put to this particular scene. But this is Guts on the roof of the building, thinking about, uh, you know, thinking about where he's going, what he's doing. Is it worth it to, to follow Griffith, right? This is, this is around the time of the request for the assassination, mm. right? But a very different song here uh, was used for this.
something specific about the music and the soundtracks? Did you want to focus on 97 or the, the, the later stuff? The only thing I can really say is that Berserk, I don't know the more modern composer, uh, Sakisu. That's the one I'm familiar with. As far as like name wise and like the other, the other stuff that he's worked on. Okay. So I can only I can only kind of like talk about that. What uh, I'm not I don't know that one off the top of my head. What uh, what are some of the, uh, the scenes or some of the, uh, the songs there? Do you remember? Um, like if you ever think of like oh Sagasu. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the later stuff. Yeah. The more like, the uh, more the more the more uh, thumping the more uh, uh, action packed. Yeah. The more the more uh, for, like, the, the, the power the power yeah. stuff. So, yeah. My brother. Yeah. Oh, my brother. Yeah. That's 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 uh, that's a good workout song. Yeah. 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 So if you haven't if you haven't seen the 2016 2017 I think this is one of his. Yeah. So while the animation quality is is uh, very different, right? This is a CGI show. Uh, the music is very very uh, different tenor in 16 and 17 as as our friend was saying. that you'd like to talk about with the group? Anybody else? Does the music add anything for you or is it just kind of a byproduct? Yeah. Well, for some of us, it's just ambiance. For some of us, it takes it to another level. All right. So. Anything else on the music here, gang, or should we switch gears? I All mean, right. G G Guts' theme is practically a meme now. Yeah. <laughs> so true I just true find statement. that funny. <laughs> right. Animation. All right, we talked about the animation a little bit earlier. I want to. I want to go uh, uh, get a, a solid uh, look here. And some of the animation quality. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows that's the noise that it makes. take that to the next level. Of course, we have the fight with Zod in 2017. I'm pretty sure these swords are hollow based on the noise that they're making. scenes from the films though. Yeah. Alright? And this is true cinematography here. Alright? The 360 camera motion, the way they set the scene. Mm. The actual accurate noises the swords make. Yep. <laughs> 18 
you plus ten cents. You know, like uh, I charge you. I charge you. <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> expect the films to be of a higher pedigree and they are if you haven't seen the films or if you're introducing somebody to the show like like my friend there on the, the hellfire club shirt if you haven't actually seen berserk uh the films are a great place to start all right agree or disagree uh, the people yes yeah, all right all right two thumbs, up. two thumbs up for the films mm -hmm. all right mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a good place to start so let's see We've got about seven minutes left. We can uh, jump here to a bit of a conclusion. Maybe not a conclusion, right? So where are we going to go from here? Uh, Miria was uh, very, very uh, well known for his long, lengthy hiatuses. Um, some people speculated that he didn't actually have the end game in place. Now, of course, uh, you guys are, are aware that his uh, his friend, uh, one of his fellow mangaka, is picking up the series, right? Yeah. All right. And, uh, you know, he claims that uh, he was there at the Genesis, and he knows where Maria was going to take the story. Do you guys feel pretty good about that? Do you feel like, like that's legitimate, or do you think that this is kind of a, a vague, uh, vague statement? Uh-huh. Um, but if it ends up being a good ending, do we know uh, that person agrees with that? Then it wouldn't necessarily matter if yeah, it was a good ending? Like, yeah, like whether it was a sin or not, if it isn't good, then, you know, all kinds of people are going to care. I mean, not no one, but like, you know, people would say, oh, it turned out well anyway. Right, right. You got a thought there, man? Yeah. Um, I oh, I, like I, 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 sorry, the guy next to you, though. No, 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 he's got a thought, he's got a thought. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hellfire Club first, then I. No, 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 no. He's got a thought for you. All right, all right. He seeds the floor. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Shit. Like, we have a little context that if they're, like, such close friends that he would be able to take the mantle, that he would want to put his best foot forward and uh, end it in a way that his friend would be satisfied with, and that hopefully will we'll all enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's a personal thing, so not everyone's going to enjoy it, but in a way that, like, he would have, you know, the author would have respected and appreciated. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to doubt that he, he, he was there, that, that he knows where Maria wanted to take the story, but at the same time, you kind of have to wonder. I kind of agree with you, though, where if the story stays true to the characters and the ending is in thematically the same vein. I think we can we can accept that. Would you guys agree? If it's thematically the same, you could accept the ending coming from whomever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Koji Mori here, this is the gentleman that's going to be taking over uh, Berserk uh, from Maria, all right? And uh, this is, a, this is a, a statement from him, uh, you know, fairly recent here. Uh, and it seems to be a very sincere statement. Uh, like we talked about, I have no reason to, to doubt the, uh, the intentions here. Um, and for something that's considered the gold standard of fantasy animation and, and, uh, and manga, uh, yeah, I would think that Mori would be very, very um, uh, motivated to keep it uh, of the same quality, of the same thematic elements, and uh, keep it true uh, to what Muria uh, would, have, uh, would have wanted there. So. Um, yeah, it'll be it'll be fun to see where it goes. Uh, they've got a team of uh, individuals working there, uh, uh, moving it forward. Um, uh, anybody think that uh, they're going to animate any more of it? Anybody, uh, anything you guys like to see animation-wise that hasn't been adapted? Would you want more animation if it looked like sixteen and seventeen? Would you care? I'd want it. The story's just that good. I'll take it. <laughs> Honestly, I just think the books just have better art. And same story. Maybe less, no, less music, but I mean, you're still getting two, you know, best parts of it. Uh -huh. 
And like, I think if you got more stuff like from movies or whatever, then I would want more um, like anime in the future. But if it's just like 2016, 17, like on one hand, it can introduce more people to Berserk who like, yep. haven't actually read the manga and stuff and just have that experience. But with Berserk, it's very hard to be able to digest that without also getting the manga. And then that way, it would kind of instantly sour yep. your experience, I think. I could see that. Now, we didn't talk about any of the, the characters from Beyond the Golden Age. This happens a lot, which is why I like to have a second panel. We didn't talk about Carnies. We didn't talk about Serpico. You know, you think about their motivations. You think about their character development. You could build an entire film around those characters, right? You guys remember the Lost Children arc? Yeah. yeah. Who wants to see that animated? That, that, that would be a hell of a film, in my opinion. There was Just a standalone movie for the Lost Children arc. Thought? Children are? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, that, that sounds cool. I would check that out for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, gang, we are at about time. Anybody have any final thoughts they'd like to share regarding Berserk, your experiences with it, you know, where you hope it goes? No? All right. Well, gang, I thank you very much for joining me today. 